John 12, 46 reads, the Lord Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Now John 10, 22 through 26 and 36 through 38. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. When the Jews surrounded him and said to him, then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt or in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep as I said to you. Now verse 36. Do you say to him whom the Father sanctified and sinned of the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So we're introduced to what's taking place in John chapter 10, 22. And this is taking place during the Feast of Dedication, which is a reference to the Feast of Hanukkah, because Hanukkah means dedication. Hanukkah, by the way, will be celebrated this year from December 10th to December 18th. And it's a feast that's celebrated over eight days. Hanukkah and the Feast of Dedication are the same thing. And they, this, this feast was not instituted during the time in which we, the framework in time which the Old Testament was written. It was instituted in between the time period in which the last Old Testament prophet wrote and John the Baptist came upon the scene. There's a 400 year period and about midway in that 400 year period were the events that took place that basically gave rise to this feast of dedication or Hanukkah, but it was celebrated and it was celebrated during the time of Jesus and probably most likely celebrated more uh, enthusiastically then than it is even today. And so it was instituted at that same time. The circumstances for it takes place as recorded in the book of the first and second book of Maccabees. And this book was written also, it's one of these intertestamental period books that were written. You might find it in like, if you have a Catholic Bible, you'll find it what's called the Apocrypha. And it's those books that were written between the time of the last prophet speaking in the book of the Old Testament and the Gospels being written. And so about in the middle of that, you have the book of Maccabees be, being written and they tell the story that gives us the history or the background for the development of this great feast. After the death of Alexander the Great, his empire was divided up among his, Gentiles, uh, among his generals, and Israel fell under the domain of one of these new Greek dynasties that rose up as they divided up Alexander the Great's kingdom. And under the domain, of, that one who held domain over Israel became, there became one by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV. And he had division throughout his kingdom, and he sought to unite it by uniting it under the Hellenistic or Greek god Zeus. Everybody would make as the supreme religion of the land the worship of Zeus. And interestingly enough, Antiochus thought himself to be a divine manifestation of Zeus, and so he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, and Epiphanes means the divine manifestation. And um, the Jews, by the way, who he ruled over, called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means Antiochus the insane or the crazy. <laughs> they had a different name for him. In 168 BC, Antiochus instituting this new religion or this demand that Zeus be the supreme one to be worshipped in all the domain that he ruled over, he forbade the worship of Yahweh in the land of Israel. He forbade that they practice any of the rites that they had practiced at that point in time. No circumcision, no keeping the Sabbaths, no sacrifices to Yahweh, none of the festivals were to be followed. There was to be no activity whatsoever that expressed or related itself to their worship of Yahweh upon the sentence of death. Once he instituted that, he also called upon various uh, priests that he had put in place of the Aaronic priesthood and the Levitical priesthood in the temple, he put in place Hellenistic Jews, Jews that had been folded into the Greek way of life. The, the, the Jews had basically, there were a group of Jews that decided that this whole idea of maintaining a sense of separation from the Gentile world had not done them very well. And that if we we're really going to succeed as a people and be safe as a people, we had to learn to merge with everybody else. 
And so he took these Jews who decided they wanted to be good Greeks or Hellenized with the rest of the world, and he put them in charge of instituting sacrifices to Zeus in the temple. And among other things, at that time, he instituted the sacrifice of swine and pigs on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. And this went on for over three years, beginning in 168 BC. This actually led to what we have, what we call now the Feast of Dedication because there was an uprising that took place. By the way, this three years period of time is still referred to this day as the abomination of desolation. And the Jews at that time felt like this was the fulfillment of what Daniel was prophesying to take place. Finally, a priestly revolt took place and over five Maccabean brothers began to lead a revolt. And these Maccabean brothers were of the priestly class. They began to lead a revolt against Antiochus and against the Hellenistic Jews that they, he had put in plow, power in the temple and ruling over Israel. And through a battle of a series of guerrilla warfare, they ultimately were able to overthrow Antiochus. They were able to take back the temple. They were able to then begin to take back the different strongholds throughout the region and establish a, a, a rule for a short period of time under their domain. And during that time, once they took it back, they began instantly to set in place as they continued out their battle in other places a purifying and rededicating of the temple that had been so defiled under Antiochus. And Hanukkah is a celebration of this time of dedication that took place in the temple. Uh, there were two problems, and this is what we're gonna answer here today. There were two problems that were faced by the Jews at that time as they addressed the need to purify this temple that had been defiled by Antiochus. And these two problems were reflected in two questions that they asked of themselves and they came up with two different solutions. And these solutions are very interesting because in a sense they're somewhat prophetic and they point us to the person of Jesus Christ. The first problem that they asked was this, how do you make something that's been defiled clean? How do you make something that's been defiled clean? As they set out to cleanse the temple, they came to the altar that had been soaked in the defiling blood of pigs. Nothing more defiling in their minds than that. And what do we do with these stones that are in place for the altar where God was to be worshiped? And so in 1 Maccabees chapter four, we read this. Let me read it to you. It, it expresses their dilemma and the solution they came up with. Then Judas, Judas detailed men to fight against those in the citadel until he had cleansed the sanctuary. He chose blameless priests devoted to the law and they cleansed the sanctuary and removed the defiled stones to an unclean place. They deliberated what to do about the altar burnt offering which had been profaned, and they thought it best to tear it down, lest it bring reproach upon them, for the Gentiles had defiled it. So they tore down the altar and stored the stones in a convenient place on the temple hill until there should come a prophet to tell them what to do with them. Now this is a period of time in which the Jews recognized that the prophets had stopped speaking. And so they were longing for a time in which a prophet would once again speak to them and tell them how to address the defilement that had come upon the altar. So they then took other unhewn stones and they made a temporary altar in that place to hold them in place until this prophet would come. And, and over time, this prophet became synonymous in the minds of the Jews with waiting for the Messiah. Just as the prophet that Moses had said would come, that would speak to the people, was synonymous with their anticipation of the Messiah to come. The Messiah would ultimately be the one who was going to come, and he would bring a cleansing to the temple of the deep defilement that had taken place, and uh, he would give them instruction on how they could remove all of the taint of sin in the place in the temple. And by the way, this was not the first time that the temple had been defiled. There have been other kings in Judah and other individuals during the time of Judah in which the temple had been defiled. You might remember Manasseh brought idols to worship the sun god and the moon god and he slayed the blood of men on the altar in order to express his sacrifices to these different gods. And so there have been other periods of defilement taking place and this was accumulating in the minds of the people. Even though God had restored them, how does he restore us from this taint and this defilement that's taken place? And so they began to wait and long for a Messiah, the Messiah to come and tell them, and the Messiah to come to fully cleanse and finish the work of removing the taint of this, this defilement that had come upon the land. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, expresses this sense of anticipation and longing for the Messiah to come, and it, it, it fits with this idea that we've just read in the book of Maccabees in the anticipation these individuals are having 
to remove the taint that was brought upon the temple through Antiochus Epiphanes. It's added, you might say, and it amplifies or it builds the intensity of the desire of the people. But here's what we read in verses one through five of Malachi chapter three. There the prophet says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former days before the defilement had taken place. And I will come near you for judgment And I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Now, take what Malachi has prophesied and the people understanding that they're waiting for the Messiah to come as one who will purge and cleanse and restore and clean and make whole. And then add to it this anticipation that you have in Maccabees chapter four of a prophet that will come and tell them how to purify the stones that have been defiled, that they've set aside waiting for a time in which they can be reassembled as the permanent place where offerings may be offered to God in the temple. And then you'll understand the question that the people are asking in John 10, 24. This is the time of dedication or the feast of dedication. This is the feast that celebrates this time in which the temple was dedicated at the, during the Maccabean period after the temple was taken back from Antiochus Epiphanes and these Hellenized, uh, these Hellenized Greek Jewish priests that were offering pig's blood on the altar. And this is in response to, and this question is informed by this desire to see a prophet come and return that will tell them how to remove the final elements of the defilement of sin from their temple and from their city. And so then the Jews come to Jesus in the middle of this feast and they surround him and they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? How long will you hold us in doubt? If you're the Christ, if you're the Messiah, if you're the one we're waiting for to do this great work, tell us plainly. So there you go, it's somewhat of the background. There's the great desire. The people understand that although they're celebrating a great moment in which they had thrown off their oppressors and Uh, which they've been restored to some extent to be able to come back and meet with God and worship him, they understand that there's a final cleansing that still remains to be done. There is a source of defilement in their lives that they are insecure has been removed from them. There's a, a creeping sense in the midst of the dazzle of the celebration of this time period that there still is a cleansing that needs to take place. And they're, they're waiting for the Messiah, the prophet to come and tell them how to take away this defilement and they want to know if Christ is the Messiah, who will, if Jesus is the Messiah who will remove this defilement that still impacts this temple and this place. I think it's hard for us in our day and age to appreciate the great desire to have defilement removed from your life. We, we don't have that idea of defilement to, as a easy access to us. The Jews in Jesus' day had long been taught from generation to generation that there are things that are holy and there are things that are unholy and those unholy things can defile you and as a result they can keep you from access to a holy God where you can worship him which was the primary identity of a Jew. If you can't approach God and worship him you, you can't exercise your primary purpose and identity and it was disconcerting for them but this whole ident- idea of, of defilement is difficult for us to keep in mind. I don't know how to illustrate this for you, but I, I imagine if you, um, if you met somebody who uh, had COVID and they were wearing a mask and you were uh, forced to take them someplace, maybe to get some medicine for them, and you came and you were driving them in your car and you're, you got the window rolled down a little bit so you can suck in the air from outside, you don't want to breathe the same, they've got their mask on, etc. You get to the place and you find that you don't have a mask to go inside to get the medicine they need, and they take their mask off and say, here, just wear this. You might think, heck, I'm not going to wear that. It, that would defile me. I'm not going to put that on. I, I had a sister who called me earlier this week. Uh, sounded as sick as a dog on the phone. It's just throats all raspy, totally plugged up, uh, complaining that she needed to get a Christmas tree. She had sent out her family on a mission, and they had failed to get the tree she wanted, and so would I... Uh, 
Would I loan my truck to her so she could go get a tree? She used my truck. I was not there at the time. She came by, used my truck. I came back later in the day. The truck had been brought back, and uh, uh, the keys were set aside for the truck. I went to use the truck, and there sitting on the seat where I had to sit is a mask. And you know, I immediately, wait, is this been worn? Has this thing been worn by this person who borrowed my truck? And here it is sitting where I didn't want to touch it. It's like I got a stick and picked it up and flung it over to the far corner of the thing. It's defiled. <laughs> Just a very minor expression of the infectious nature of sin and its defilement that comes upon an individual and that the Jews recognized and understood. And In Jesus' day, the idea of contact tracing was very active. If you had come in contact with some defiled person and you hadn't gone through a certain ritual of cleansing and washing in order to remove that defilement, then they would find out everybody else who came in contact with you, and all of you were excluded from the temple and the place of worship, and all of you actually were excluded from circulating with anyone else in fellowship because you would just spread the defilement of your life on others until you had gone through a process of time and a certain ritual of cleansing and washing and some sacrifice was made for you in order for you to be restored in fellowship and everybody else would come in contact with you. And so it, they were quite cautious about touching individuals if they didn't know where that individual had been or who they'd been in contact with. And, and frankly, it even got more serious for them when it came near to the festivals and the holidays because they, they didn't want to be in danger of missing out on those holidays. In fact, during the holidays prior to that, they would send individuals out to go to every place where there was a tomb uh, and they would have the person repaint that tomb in white so it would be really clearly seen that that was a tomb so everybody would know as they were walking along to avoid that place because they, of all things, didn't want to come in contact with a dead body. That would definitely defile you because death was an expression of the deep consequences of sin. They didn't want to come in contact with it because if they came in contact with something that was dead, they wouldn't be able to go and carry out their worship and their fulfillment and you remember what the Lord Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, you're, you're like whitewashed graves. You're white on the outside, but people ought to avoid you because you're full of defiled dead bones. But this is the question that's being asked. Again, I think the notion of the defilement of sin is largely lost in our age. We've so communicated the idea of easy access to God that the average Christian takes it as a given that they can fester in the sewer of, sewer of defiling thoughts and attitudes and actions and then do God a favor by sauntering into his presence for a prayer or for a blessing or to sing some motivating song to themselves or others. But the question should be, as it was in that day, more like this. Who can take away the deep trenches of defiling sin from our lives? How can we who are soaked in the rancid stains of sin ever be made fit to come near to a holy God? Who can take away the stain that runs so deep within us? The, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who can know. Who can make that deep, wicked heart clean so from the heart I might worship the God, God in spirit and truth? Who can somehow work upon my life? The Bible also says that all of our righteousness are like filthy, defiled rags. Who can make me clean? I can't come to God in my own righteousness. Who can make me clean? And we need to be careful that we don't easily and flippantly give the answer. We've learned the right evangelical answer to give, but we give it so readily that we don't allow a person or we don't take serious the distress the person should have. In fact, we actually signal to individuals, don't feel distressed about your sin. There's an easy fix. And we end up presenting the gospel like a roncomatic machine, right? You can slice it and dice it and remove it from your life without any effort whatsoever. But the Jews knew the distress and the deep defilement that sin created in the back of their minds. And so they ask questions like, can sin stain be removed from my life and I stand before a holy God to worship him and be safe? And they ask questions like, can God remove my sins and cleanse me so thoroughly that I'm free to be in fellowship not only with him but with others without defiling them? We should ask those kinds of questions. 
That should be uh, a riddle in our minds, in the minds of those who come to Christ, because we take sin as seriously as God takes sin. This is the kind of question that the Jews were asking. Even though they were worshiping the temple, they understood that there was a residue of defilement and they didn't know how to remove it. and They had no answer for it. Now when you go and study the Gospel of John, it's been suggested that one of the ways you can study the Gospel of John is you can follow that John introduces us, he brings Christ to us, but he introduces Christ to us through the various celebration of the various feasts of Israel. And that in each point, John introduces something of a of a question or a desire or a longing that those festivals introduce and that the Lord Jesus then comes on the scene at the time to present himself as the one who fulfills that longing or that promise that is indicated in the feast and this is true in the feast of dedication or the feast of Hanukkah as well. So the Lord Jesus will come, they'll ask these questions and then the Lord Jesus will demonstrate that he is the one that's the answer to the question they're asking. He actually says to him, listen, you uh, need to believe me. In Hanukkah, there was a miracle that took place. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. A miracle that uh, they are celebrating. And the Lord Jesus is saying, that miracle validates who, that God was real and God was with you. And I want you now to look at my life and my miracles and know that I'm validating that I'm here and God is among you. And I'm here to do a work in this place. I'm the one who makes the defiled, the thing that is defiled clean. And in John chapter 11, the Lord Jesus demonstrates this. The next miracle that we read about, when this question rises, are you the one who can make things clean? Are you the one who can take the defilement away? The next miracle is a, a message comes to the Lord Jesus as he's ministering along the Jordan that the one he's loved has died, Lazarus. And the Lord Jesus delays in going to Lazarus for four days. Finally, the Lord Jesus travels to where Lazarus is. Lazarus has been dead and his body has been rotting in the tomb for a lengthy period of time. In fact, it's one of Lazarus' sisters who anoints Jesus later on with a beautiful perfume that he, she pours over his feet, uh, Mary. But this same family, we are certain, would have poured out all of their anointment and oils over the body of the dead, and it was a way of masking the scent of the decay of rot that would take place. And so the anointed body of Lazarus laid in the tomb, but it was still not enough to fend off the awful stench of the rotting of his flesh. When the Lord Jesus arrives, he asks them to take him to the tomb and to roll back the stone where he lies. And Martha, the other sister of Lazarus, says, Lord, he, he stinks by now. Jesus still has him roll back the, the stone from his grave. The Lord Jesus cries into the grave, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, still wrapped in his grave clothes, waddles out of that grave healthy and alive without the stench of death on him at all, vacated completely from that place. Yes, Jesus can cleanse what is defiled and he can take it and dedicate it wholly and completely unto himself. Your sin is gone. The stench of your sin can be removed. The defilement is gone from your life. Your life is set free to be in fellowship with God. Your life is unbound to be in fellowship with others without defiling them, without defiling them. Until you understand the ugliness, the great ugliness of your sin, you'll not understand how wonderful it is that this is true. That he can take away the defilement that's on you because of your sins. And not only is it on you before God, but it doesn't go from you to anyone else. What a promise in that. What a wonderful promise in that. Jesus not only forgives us, he cleanses us and he makes us holy. And that's what he's demonstrating to the Jews there. Nothing to them was more defiling than a dead body and immediately after this question is asked, he goes and he raises a dead man who'd been dead for a lengthy period of time and brings him out alive out of the tomb. Here's the second problem they had. The second problem they asked was, how will we gain light to guide us in our work of dedication? How will we gain light to guide us in our work of dedication? In other words, when the Maccabees overtook this temple from these Hellenized Jews that Antiochus Epiphanes had put over the temple, they now had to cleanse that temple out and dedicate it. They had to remove all the different idols reflecting all the various gods of the Greeks. They had to go into the Holy of Holies because Antiochus had actually put an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. They had to go through all the temple grounds to purify all the things that had been defiled over a period of three years because this had been going on in three years. In fact, this work of defilement began uh, exactly three, uh, 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 three years to the day in which Antiochus first began to sacrifice pigs on the altar. 
And they had to go through and cleanse all of that out, but there was a problem. They, they needed light to go into these recesses to burn, to cleanse it, but there was a rule that if they were to go into these places, they had to go with a dedicated or holy light. They had to burn oil that had already been dedicated and purified and consecrated and set apart for this place. They couldn't take common oil in that place to burn a common fire. They had to burn a holy fire from dedicated oil, and where would they get that? And they looked around and they found they found enough oil to burn for one day, one day in order to go into the temple and cleanse it. This is, the, this is the story that is told at this time. And the problem was the work before them was a work that was gonna take more than one day. It took eight days. But they took that oil, they dedicated themselves to the task and the work, and they lit their lamps, and they went into the temple to begin going through the work of identifying where the things had been defiled and removing all of the idols and purifying that place and reestablishing holy items and articles to be used solely for the worship of God in the temple again. And the oil didn't burn for one day. The oil burned for eight days until the work was complete. And that is the miracle of Hanukkah. And so now Hanukkah is celebrated in Jewish homes still to this day with a menorah. It's the central element of their celebration. It, it, it has a, a central candle, which is called the servant candle, and then there are four candles on either side, eight for each day. And with the servant candle, as the first day comes, they light one candle and put the servant candle in place. The second night they come and they light the servant candle, but now they light two candles for two days. And on and on it progresses until at the end they've lit, lit the whole menorah on the last day of, or the last evening of Hanukkah. And then they are instructed to put that candle in a place where its light can be seen outside their home. So usually it's put in a windowsill or a place like that so it could shine about. In Jesus' day, this celebration was uh, more enthusiastically celebrated, I'm certain. Actually, Josephus, who wrote shortly after the time of Christ, called it the Festival of Lights. He's the first one who called it the Festival of Lights. And um, he kind of downplays it a little bit, but that's because he was a historian for the Roman uh, government, and he didn't want to upset the Romans. And this was a holiday that celebrates the Jews throwing off oppressive foreign rulers. So you have to kind of play down a holiday like that. But I guarantee you the rest of the Jews didn't play it down. They played it up because they were oppressed under the Roman rule and leadership was so in debt. The Feast of Dedication came, the Feast of Hanukkah came, they lit all their lights. In fact, one historian suggests that they didn't just light a light for each family in their home, but each member in the family in the home would light a separate menorah. And so if there were eight people living in the home, there were eight lights, or 10 people living in the home, there were 10 lights lit on, lit on the first day, and on the last day, there were 80 lights that were lit in that home, so that at the end of Hanukkah, every house was beaming with light. Expressing the light that God gave to dedicate and make clean their lives so that they might be restored into a proper worship of God. That's, the, that's what was celebrated at that time. The Lord Jesus comes along at this time and says that this miracle light that was given at that point in time was a warrant that God was among you and that God was working. And by the way, the Jews oftentimes asked the Lord Jesus for a sign to prove that he was who he said he was or who they suspected that he was and, and he usually didn't give it to them. I, I was actually remembering a story my brother told me. We had a little boy in our neighborhood when we were little kids growing up on Bainbridge Island, and the boy was older than I was and a little bit younger than my brother, but my brother was five years older than I. And um, they had, we had about five acres, and his family had maybe about four or five acres alongside of our property. And uh, these boys all had horses, and they used to ride at night, their horses throughout the neighborhood, and my brother would ride with them. I didn't get to go along with them, but I could watch them ride and wish I was with them riding, but anyhow. Richie was the boy's name, Richie Sparks, Richie Sparks, and um, my brother was trying to share the gospel with him and tell him about Jesus and get him to believe in God, and Richie said he didn't believe in God, and John was trying to convince him, and they were outside playing basketball by Richie's barn, and Richie said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll believe in God if I make this basket, and so Richie uh, grabbed the uh, basket, and he went away from the barn a number of paces, and then he began to turn himself around in circles, and then all of a sudden he hucked the ball as hard as he could, and he was throwing it over the barn, so it was not even near where the basket was. It was over the barn, away from where the barn was, but as it was going, it hit a light at the end of a tall light pole, and it deflected directly down and swished to the bag, ba basket. My brother said he led him to Christ that day. I don't know if that's the case or not. Looking for a sign, looking for evidence. Light, the people said, 
light in this time was a sign of God's miracle presence among us. The Lord Jesus basically answered and says, if you're the Messiah, they say, you, you reveal it to us, tell us plainly. Jesus answers, says, though you don't believe in me, believe in my works. And you will know that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. Look, I'm, I'm evidencing it. Believe all the things I've done. I've already given you the evidence of who I am, what I've come to do. The Jews wanted a testimony of light because God had given them throughout their season light as a testimony of his presence. There was the light of the burning bush that Moses came to. There, there was a light uh, of fire that came down on Mount Sinai when the law was given. There was the light of fire that came down upon the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies after it was established and Moses dedicated the temple as they were wandering through the wilderness. And later on when the temple was built and Solomon dedicated the temple, there was fire again that came down of light that came upon that place that was so intense that all the priests and all the singers and all the worshipers had to draw back from the temple. They couldn't be in that place. So intense was the power of God's light in that moment. There was light as we've We've studied not just recently that came upon Mount Carmel, upon the altar that Elijah offered up to demonstrate that the Lord was God over all the people instead of Baal. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, which was another great feast that took place just prior to the Feast of Dedication, it was also a feast that was full of lights as the people celebrated the light that came upon them as they wandered out of Egypt and the wilderness into, and they made their way in booze into the Promised Land. And so... It was, a, it was a celebration that was involved a lot of light. In fact, some people suggest that the Feast of Dedication was actually a delayed Feast of Tabernacles. That because it was the most near feast after they had been liberated from Antiochus' reign, they decided, let's celebrate now the Feast of Tabernacles. And so they began to celebrate with light at that time. And that's why they brought light in that moment. But again, there are other reasons for it as we've read, like the light that God gave for the cleansing of that temple and purifying that temple. This light offered to the Jews a light of comfort. It told them that God was with them. It's still today true, isn't it? Isn't light a comfort? How many of you have little children that want to have a night light in their room? Just a little light, just a little crack in the door to leave open. You know, we have grandkids that came over the other day and they're kind of noisy and we're going to spend the night with us and we put them in the bed and then I go to close the door and they cry out as soon as you start closing. No, no. I've got to leave it open, just a crack. We want it closed so we can talk and they not hear us, but they want it open a little bit. They want a little light to come in. It's comforting to them. It was a light of confirmation that God would direct them and guide them. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where the lights have gone out in your house or you woke up in the middle of the night going somewhere and you've walked with one foot on one side of a door jam and one foot on the other side of the door jam and you wish you had a light to confirm your way so you know where you're going and it was a light of confirmation, leading them in God's will and God's purposes for their lives. It, it, the light that God gave was a light of cleansing as well as we've watched, as we've talked about here. They needed light to cleanse out that temple. You won't do an efficient job of being clean and washing yourself if you don't have the lights on. You need to see in the light. It was also a light of commitment. It was a light that told them that God was among them and with them and that God was bringing the dawning of his Messiah. As we just read in Isaiah chapter 9, let's go back and read it again. Let me read to you verse 2 and verses 6 and 7. This idea that light confirms the presence of God and, and demonstrates God's commitment to be among them and with them. Verse 2 of Isaiah 9, the prophet says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of the host will perform this. Light is an expression of God's committed presence that God will answer and do what God has promised to do in their lives. John chapter 11, we have the miracle of the Lord Jesus raising from the dead Lazarus, which demonstrates that he is that one, that prophet who's able to come and deal with the defiling elements of sin. But that miracle also is a miracle that demonstrates that he is the one who brings true light to people's lives. For in the moment in which the Lord Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb, the dead, lifeless eyes of Lazarus sparkled with the light of life. And he came out 
And Christ put there in that place an evidence of the comforting, confirming, cleansing, committed light that comes even at the point of death and even in the grave. It was light. And it was this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead that kind of went over into the next festival that takes place you'll read about in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we're now at the Feast of Passover, but the people are still enamored by this miracle that's been performed, uh, vindicating or demonstrating the messianic power of Christ to both remove defilement from sin and to bring life to light in people's lives, or light to life in people's lives. And so they're still talking about the bringing back from the dead of Lazarus. In fact, the people are gathering around at that time to see Jesus, but they're also gathering around to see Lazarus because Jesus is with Lazarus during this last Passover feast. And if you read chapter 12, you see multiple times that the Lord Jesus speaking in light of the people as they gather around Lazarus, Jesus speaking of the fact that he's come to bring light. He's come from to bring light and he's the fulfillment of light. In verse 46 of John chapter 12, at the end of the feast, Jesus cries out, I have come as a light into the world. Whoever believes in me shall not walk in darkness. I'm an answer to the concerns and the riddles that were introduced at the feast of dedication. I'm the one who removes defilement from life. And I'm the one. I'm the one who brings you light. I'm the answer. Our Savior is the fulfillment of Hanukkah's promise. He's not only the one who cleanses us, He's our abiding, ever-shining light who lives within us, expressing the divine presence of God in our lives. He's the light of comfort. He says to the brokenhearted, come to me and I'll give you rest. He says to the lonely, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He is a light of comfort that comes shining upon lonely shepherds and inviting them to see where the Savior has been born to them. He's a light of comfort. He's a light of confirmation. He comes to us and he leads us and guides us He says, whoever believes in me shall not walk in darkness. If your life, if you're living your life and you're not living it in obedience to the Lord Jesus, you'll find your life increasingly confusing and you'll have a harder time coming to points of sureness and certainty. But when you yield to him and you surrender to him and you give your life to him, your periods of confusion and uncertainty begin to dissipate as you obediently walk in the light of his own presence. He's a light of cleansing. 1 John verse, chapter 1, verses 5-7 through seven speaks of this cleansing light. This is the message John writes that we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in the darkness and lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There it is. There's light, an answer to keep ourselves holy and pure so that we might enjoy fellowship with one another and the removal of the defilement of sin that is provided for us as Jesus fulfills the promise of Hanukkah. He's the light of commitment. He came. He was born among us. He came to give himself fully to us. He committed to us himself so completely and fully that he died for our sins so that he may live in us forever and we may live in him. He comforts, he confirms, he cleanses, he commits. He's light. What's the application? Worship him. Exalt in him. If this isn't impressive to you, you need to understand the defiling nature of sin and you need to survey the world you live in and realize how dark the world is that you're in. You need to long for something beyond what you've come up with. The Bible pronounces woes upon individuals who try to live within the spark of the own life they create. Mm -hmm. Living in the spark from spark to spark of some little light they can generate. Says their way will be a way into misery. Mm -hmm. No, you need something more sufficient than that. That cleansing that comes from God alone where he washes us and cleanses us and releases us from that sense of defilement and I hate saying it, but if, if, if that doesn't impress you and delight you, then I, I pray that God would impress upon you how defiled you are and how defiling sin is. So it would delight you. It would delight you to know 
that he removes from you all the residue, all the residue of sin. It's not like we forget the memories of things we've done in the past, but that don't weigh us down. They're not a weight against us. Once you've been cleansed and the defilement is removed, you're only reminded that the defilement was removed. You're clean. In the same way, if you're satisfied with your own, the spark of your own moral genius, I pray God would frustrate it. And you'd find out what dark, wretched world your own light will take you into so that you would long for the beaming, bright, brilliant light of the Savior and live in that light. Come to the light, live in the light. Let the light of Christ shine in you out to others. Let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Let's bow our heads. Perfect in every way, Lord Jesus. An answer to every dilemma in the human heart. Who can make us clean? Who can forgive us? Who can remove the defilement of sin? Who can lead us from that point so we don't go there again? You can. All sufficient one. Answer to the deepest needs of men and women. You make us clean. You offer us up so that we might come in your presence and we praise you now in your presence, dear Father. In your presence, O Holy Son, drawn there by the Holy Spirit, pure, cleansed, washed, covered, and so fit to meet with you safely. And so through the blood of Jesus Christ, able to meet with one another and not defile anyone else, but actually introduce them to the one who removes all defilement. Praise you and thank you for this, dear Jesus. And we thank you as well that we have in you the light of life. Forgive us when we dive into our own ingenuities and resources. And we trust in that without checking it against the brilliant light of our Savior Jesus Christ. Seek to walk in that light. We'll give you glory for this. We ask that we would, you would work in us by your spirit that we might shine in this age as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.